All right. It's one minute after, so we're going to get started because there's lots to cover. Um, my name is Emily and I am your Connectra program coordinator. So welcome everyone to the Accessible Community Forum on Accessible Housing. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the importance of the land on which this online event is taking place. These are the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, and in particular, the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the tsleil First Nations. This acknowledgement is a statement to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their history. Please join me in a brief moment of reflection. All right, thank you. So just to outline the purpose of this community forum, um, this is presented by the Disability Foundation and co-hosted by Connectra Society. The purpose of this forum is to gain insights and feedback from the community around accessible housing in British Columbia. Here at Connectra, we value diverse opinions and perspectives, and we want this to be a safe environment for everyone to share. So please be respectful of what others have to say. A few housekeeping rules. This forum is being recorded and streamed to Facebook and YouTube. So you may choose to have your camera turned on or off at any time. All participants will be muted upon entry. To ask a question, you can either type your question in the chat box or use the raise hand function under reactions in the bottom of your screen. A moderator will call on you and unmute your microphone. Uh, if you're having any issues with any of that, you can also message me directly on um, Zoom and I will try and help you out. Use the chat for comments. If you require a screen reader, we recommend that you close the chat. Uh, we will be sending out a complete transcript of the chat after the event to all attendees. We also have automatic closed captioning available. Please go to the bottom of the Zoom meeting, click live transcript, and then show subtitles to turn them on. And our agenda today is a brief welcome. Uh, we will have our panelists introduce themselves. Then we will get going with the discussion, which always flies by. And at about 5 2 we'll have a closing summary with some closing remarks. So we're just going to play a quick connector video outlining some of our other programming here for you now. Connectra creates opportunities for people living with disabilities by providing information, resources, and programming geared towards greater inclusion and quality of life. Check out some of the programs we offer through our online learning platform, Connect Together, including our Service Mondays, where we highlight a local organization or initiative, Wednesday Chair Yoga with Bobby Seal Kobiski. Thursday Adapted Fitness with Megan Williamson. Friday Rotating Dance Classes hosted by Janice Lawrence and Joanne Cuff. And other initiatives including presentations by the Disabled Independent Gardeners Association's Growable Program and our Perspective Series. Also coming up on July 22nd, we have an Accessible Community Forum on Accessible Housing in British Columbia. Check out our updated programs calendar on our website, connectra.org, or find us on Facebook at Connectra Society. Awesome. We also have a Connectra community barbecue coming up on August 16th. I will put the event registration in the chat, or you can also check it out on your own time at connectra.org slash events. It's a free event, free, free lunch come hang out with your community in person. Okay, so now we're going to get to the panelists. I uh, will do a brief introduction of everyone and then I will let the panelists introduce themselves. So today's panel consists of Paul Gauthier, founder and executive director of the Individualized Funding Resource Center Society and the Right Fit Project. Karen Pasqua, accessibility and universal design consultant and co-founder of Meaningful Access. Marika Albert, the Policy Director at BC Nonprofit Housing Association. 
Stephanie Allen, the Vice President of Strategic Business Operations and Performance for BC Housing, as well as a Housing Development Specialist focused on building affordable and equitable communities. And last but not least, Mayor Sherry Minions, youngest mayor ever on Vancouver Island, carving a new path for Port Alberni's future. Now we'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Paul, we'll start with you. Great. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, I just want to first acknowledge that today I'm speaking from the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tlaibos uh, peoples. And uh, I'm so excited to be here on this important topic around housing. Uh, I happen to be a person with lived experience. I use an electric wheelchair to get around. And myself personally, I've needed to find accessible, affordable, and safe housing. Um, personally, I had difficulties finding housing and just not being able to access proper home supports and equipment and devices. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of the Right Fit program, which is a partnership between the Disability Alliance BC and the Individualized Funding Resource Center, two organizations that have worked collaboratively together. So I look forward to talking more about the Right Fit program and uh, really look forward to this discussion today. What a great panel you have. Yes, thank you for being a part of it. Karen, we'll move on to you. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm Karen Pasqua. Thank you for having me. I am a universal design and accessibility consultant uh, prior to my mat maternity leave, working with the city of Surrey as their universal design and accessibility specialist, and now working with my lovely husband on uh, meaningful access consulting. So we're excited to help the community become more accessible to all of us and help seniors stay in their homes and, and really help move the needle forward so that we can all uh, participate in all aspects of community life. Wonderful. Thank you. And Marika, we'll move on to you next. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for uh, uh, for welcoming me onto the panel. Um, like Paul, I'm also calling in from the unceded traditional territory of the Coast uh, Salish people, uh, specifically the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and uh, as, a, as an organization that represents nonprofit housing providers across the province, we think it's really important uh, for staff at the association and also for us to work with our members to really acknowledge that the housing that we build is on built on stolen land and that uh, reconciliation and really coming and, and seeing ourselves um, as part of the reconciliation process is extremely important in building inclusive communities as well. So I'm the policy director. I oversee our research, advocacy, and education departments. And it's uh, our department that really does a lot of work um, with our membership, which is uh, approximately 500 nonprofit housing providers across the province that deliver a diverse uh, 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 diverse unit types um, and different types of housing services. Um, and our department really is uh, the one, the department that pushes for policy change that uh, leads the education and capacity building for our sector. And we're in a position to be able to challenge um, historical ways that we've thought about what accessible housing is um, and try and expand our understanding of what that means and also ensure that when we do this policy work that it's a, a, it's a human-centered approach and it's based on feedback we get from folks who are actually in need of accessible housing um, and what that really means along with supporting uh, work around building inclusive communities. So I'll leave it there for now. Absolutely, important work. Uh, Stephanie Allen, BC Housing. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, really thrilled to be chatting with you all today. Um, I am Stephanie Allen, uh, Vice President of Strategic Business Operations and Performance at BC Housing, as mentioned. I am speaking today also from the ancestral unceded lands, occupied lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. I recognize the work that's required to act and build community and solidarity um, in recognition of the colonial um, long-standing impacts that have, have been had on uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, 
and particularly on the nations uh, who have called this land their home for thousands of years. Um, really want to just recognize that I am a non-disabled person, uh, that I speak um, only to amplify and center the voices of people with disabilities. Um, and that's really the way that BC Housing is approaching our work. Um, we've for a long time built accessible housing, um, uh, as, as we've called it, a mostly wheelchair accessible housing, a 5% kind of a, a target that we've always had. But we recognize that that has not necessarily been inclusive of all disabilities. And, and now that the province has implemented new legislation under the Accessible BC Act, we are working to really expand our, our definition of accessibility, ensuring that it is defined um, by those who are most impacted and will be the ones telling us what is accessible uh, versus us um, doing so from a, a, a lens of, of not having uh, the analysis or the lived experience. Um, really, you know, we've, we've worked uh, closely with Paul's group on the Right Fit program. That has been something that we've seen some building success in, um, but we really want to continue to focus on the expertise that res resides in people living in community housing, um, ensuring that their voices are at the center and that the barriers that have long been uh, in place due to ableism are removed. So looking forward to our chat. Thank you, Stephanie. And Mayor Sherry Minions. Thank you very much, everyone. I am Shari Minions, Mayor for the City of Port Alberni, and really happy to be here today. I am joining from the unceded traditional territories of the Sushot and Hupachesset First Nations. And as always, just grateful um, to have the opportunity to join from these lands and to live and work and enjoy every day. Um, so really happy to be here. Um, I, I I feel really privileged to be on this panel um, because I think we have just a panel of um, incredible experts um, here and people with great backgrounds and great experiences. And from my perspective, um, I am not you know, an expert in any way on um, accessible housing. I think it's an area I actually have a lot to learn, but um, myself and certainly um, only able to be successful as a result of having a really fantastic council working alongside me, um, I think have been really successful in, in bringing a lot of um, um, housing into our community over the last four years that I've been very privileged to be the mayor of this community. Um, so I'm really happy to be here um, more than anything else to learn from all of you, um, you know, to, to gain a better understanding of um, what accessible housing truly looks like in our communities so that we can, I can improve the direction that my community is going as well. Um, and also really excited to share some of the successes that we have had um, in Port Alberni over the last four years. Um, I don't know the exact number of units, um, but we have had um, probably in the range of 400 units um, funded um, a variety of housing projects from um, you know, uh, housing for women and children fleeing abusive relationships to indigenous led um, affordable housing. We've got low energy housing. Um, we've had projects approved for new shelter beds. Um, we recently got approval for a sleeping pod project that is a partnership with our local friendship center. Um, and really, and, and several more. Um, it really just is incredible how much we've been able to get done through the partnerships that exist in our community. And BC Housing um, has been a huge part of, of our success as well and the relationship that we have with them. So um, yeah, excited to share some of, of how we've kind of gotten there. Um, we've taken a, a pretty, I would say, um, proactive approach in, in looking for opportunity to provide land to any housing projects that um, could benefit from it. We're fortunate to have a lot of municipally owned land in the community, less every day, because I always joke that um, everywhere I go, I give away land uh, for housing projects, but um, we would rather see it, it used um, to build really the spectrum of housing that we need in our community rather than sit vacant. So um, thrilled to be here and really looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's fantastic work. Okay, awesome. Now I would love to hand things over to our hosts. So please welcome Ben Postmas and Rachel Skidmore from Family Support Institute of BC. Uh, ben and Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about how you've been actively involved in the accessible housing in BC discussion? Thanks, Emily. Um, this is great. You've got you've you've assembled a great panel here and. Um, yeah, so um, myself, along with Rachel, we've been co-hosting um, 
housing option Zooms for families every, every Thursday evening on Zoom for the last two years. And uh, we bring in uh, a variety of guests and uh, sharing different models. And we have self-advocates come in and a lot of the folks that are on this panel have been our guests. And uh, our audience is province-wide and we're just about, um, we want to share uh, options to families um, that are out there and uh, hopefully it sparks interest and, and, um, and gets these kind of housing projects uh, for our family members happening in their communities. And uh, just a bit about FSI, Family Support Institute. We are a provincial non-for-profit society committed to supporting families who have a family member with a disability. Uh, my daughter brings me to this, to this uh, organization. I've been involved with FSI for about 30 years and in the last uh, four years as the regional network coordinator for the Kootenays. And we're unique in Canada and the only grassroots family to family organization with a broad volunteer base and our supports and services are free to any family. And I'll pass it to Rachel. Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and my pronouns are she, her. I'm coming to you from the unceded stolen lands of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Songhees, um, Esquimalt Nation, and the Woosnitch Nation. So that's here in Victoria, BC. And housing has been a huge concern of mine since before my youngest daughter was born. So I was a single mom with a one and a half year old. I happen chance to get into a co-op right before my second daughter was born. And when she was born, I realized that due to the complexity of her, her diagnoses, I wasn't going to be able to work for a significant amount of time. Thankfully, I was in the co-op and I was able to be deeply subsidized. So I was able to keep my house, my my unit and I was able to spend the time needed with Jordan. Problem was there was stairs. So my hope from the beginning was that she would be strong enough to be able to figure out how to get up and down the stairs. Unfortunately, that's also something that I regret teaching her day by day because she flies up and down them like nobody's business. We were able to stay at that co-op for 12 years and it was brilliant and beautiful and a, a, a community that just helped no matter what was going on and which was great because I was alone with two two very different children when I started with Family Support Institute 10 years ago as a volunteer housing became even more significant because I was looking at families who had more experience in the life than me and watching them struggle to get housing for their family members who were of age and figuring out supports and the constant moves. So looking forward to Jordan's future, it was always in the back of my head. How was she going to fit into any boxes? Cause she's somewhat ambulatory 90% of the time. She has a vision impairment. She has, she's very loud. She's very sensory seeking. What's that going to look like moving forward? And it was I, I, sheer luck that we were able to actually secure a place where she'll be able to age in it if she so chooses, and we can make it completely accessible for her. So I've been very lucky and and I realized that I've been very privileged also. So housing, helping other people learn about options and helping them find solutions, just it, it makes me feel like I'm giving back. So that's what brings me to this conversation and why Ben and I started doing the Zooms that we were doing because we just want, we want our, our family members to flourish. Yeah, it's awesome, very important work. Thank you for sharing all of that. So let's get into it. So Ben and Rachel will start us off with some questions gathered from our survey feedback. Uh, just a reminder to all participants here, please post your comments or questions in the chat at any time or use the raised hand function and we'll make sure that a moderator calls on you. We'll try to get to everybody's questions. So I'll hand it off to Ben. All right, so here we go. Um, so many people in the survey indicated that the wait lists for accessible housing through BC Housing were too long 
and made the process of securing accessible housing impractical or unobtainable. Stephanie, can you speak to the reason behind this and what is being done, if anything, to improve wait times? Yeah, that's a pretty important question um, and recognize how challenging it is um, right now for people that are applying for housing and looking for affordable housing in the province. So there's a number of initiatives underway to obviously create more of the right supply. Um, that is work that we have been doing under a number of different programs, um, kind of most main, uh, main program would be our community housing fund. But the other thing that we're doing is looking for ways to improve our rent supplement program so that families can access rent supplements um, and use them in the private market. If they find housing in a location that works for them um, with the layouts that work for them. Um, and so that would be, you know, another way to kind of think of the supply being expanded. Um, but there's no doubt that the wait times are challenging, frustrating. Um, we're doing our best to build as fast as we can. Um, more community acceptance is going to be helpful uh, so that we don't see, um, you know, local communities push back um, against important and critical housing. And I know there's a lot of programs at the federal and the provincial level being contemplated to invite more of the private sector to create uh, affordable or at least market rental housing that's more, um, you know, uh, accessible to, to incomes uh, that people are actually making. So I don't think there's a, a magic answer to this. I think it's going to take some years to continue to, to address these issues. Um, but I recognize how deeply frustrating this is and how we really do need to pull together to do better. But those are some of the ways that we are addressing it. Stephanie, as a follow up, you mentioned you mentioned the portable subsidies for families to help get them into private sectors because there isn't enough BC housing out there available. Is there any we, we get asked quite frequently, is there any chance of people with disabilities who might be single or not living in a family unit to also get portable rental subsidies so that they can find the right the right place for them. Yeah, I think that's part of what we're looking at on the expansion of the program, because typically we have a rent subsidies that usually go in a few directions or rent supplements. It's, you know, typically for people who are leaving homelessness, um, typically for seniors and then for families. So I think we have to recognize that there's a more diverse need and how we can better address that need through our supplements. We do have a program review underway right now. Um, so with that program review, I anticipate that we've done we've done some very broad consultation, that those are the kinds of recommendations that we want to see applied to the policies so that these can be more inclusively and more uh, used within within communities and for particularly for people with disabilities. Thank you. It, Stephanie. It, Paul? Okay, yeah, I, I just like to add and I think, you know, uh, the right fit has been. Uh, really, really excited about working with BC Housing in addressing the issue of the fact that there is not enough accessible housing available. The, the need is great. And I think one of the things that the Right Fit program does is to make sure that when there is accessible housing available, that it doesn't get lost to non-people with disabilities. Uh, in the past, we have seen a lot of units that were fully accessible, not going directly to those that were wheelchair users. And, and the reason for that is that housing providers had a hard time uh, connecting in regards to this. Um, uh, we've been working with uh, uh, BC and NPHA, uh, Marika's group, um, just been fantastic in regards to us communicating with housing providers. Um, so we're developing further relationships with housing providers. Um, we do what we call accessible checklists. And that has really been helpful because now we're able to find out ex units and what, what they consist of, such as, do they have a roll-in shower? Do they have door openers? You know, uh, are the countertops at the level where somebody can use it? And recognize the fact that certain individuals can access certain units, but other people cannot. So what we do is we have a, a wait list of 138 people um, that are looking for housing. But what's really neat about how we do this is that we actually have a relationship 
with those 138 people. So we actually know what they're looking for in the way of housing. And the last thing I wanna say is that BC Housing, as part of our pilot stages, provided the right fit with 10 rental supplements. And because of those 10 rental supplements, we have been able to house 10 people that were able to go out into the market to be able to look at uh, connecting with accessible units. And we're working closely with BC Housing to go back to the housing ministry to look at more rental supplements being available for people with disabilities. So it is something that is on the radar. Uh, I think the ministry understands the need for this. Um, and we're working on developing uh, a feasibility study to how to, for it to all work. So it, it's that collaborative approach that I think BC Housing is reaching with us. And I think it's been a real collaborative effort. That makes me so happy. Terry, you had a question? Uh, yeah, thank you. So I'm a, a town councillor in the uh, town, town of Sydney on the island. And we, some years ago, started to make it mandatory that 20% of all units in multifamily uh, dwellings, whether that's townhouses or uh, condos or apartments, had to be um, ad adaptable, not accessible. Um, so a couple of things. One of the, we're trying to get them to uh, de developers to build accessible units, but there doesn't appear to be, or we're not aware of a matching program. So when I talk to developers about, can you, you know, we're, we'll be more inclined to give you the variance if uh, for whatever it is they want for additional density, if you include some accessible units and they're reluctant to do that because they don't know how they would go about allocating those. Um, so I'm wondering what sort of program might be available to assist municipalities in the development community to be able to open up that supply to you. And then also, um, uh, oh, sorry, I lost. I'll leave, I'll leave you with that question for a start. Maybe the other one will come to me. Paul, oh, I think this question is going to you. Uh, to me, did you say? I think so. How do we connect people with disabilities to the developers who are building, whether for rental or or for sale, so that people yeah. get the right oh, right fit? Great, great. And, and so I, I and and just so you know that the right fit program has been operating in the Lower Mainland, um, but as part of uh, working with the uh, Ministry of Housing, um, NBC Housing, we're looking to be expanding our program across the province uh, uh, and, and, and the capital region on the island is something that, it, you know, is a lot, one of our logical next steps for sure. Um, and so we don't just keep track of individuals with disabilities that need uh, affordable housing, because I mean, obviously that's one of the big issues is getting access to affordable housing. But we keep uh, we we do keep a list of individuals that are looking for housing in general as well. So there may be people that are able to go and pay market. Um, and so we are keeping track of individuals with disabilities uh, that have variety of financial situations. Um, so I, I think it is about us connecting um, with the housing providers. Um, uh, and, and those that are looking to fill their units uh, to be connected to the right fit, uh, for sure. And I think that uh, uh, kudos to you in pushing for the 20%, by the way, I think it's really important that we continue to, per, uh, you know, when we look at the population of people with disabilities, that 20% uh, is, a, is something that we should continue to, to push forward with. So I guess for, for municipalities that want to make sure that these uh, units go to people that need them, um, I'm just wondering, like, what can we be doing now? Like, do we, so, do we uh, refer the development community to you? Should we start to uh, publicize that the right fit is available in the CRD and uh, get people to uh, contact you to populate your waiting list? So Terry, I, I, absolutely. I, I want to be careful in that we're 
we're not in the area yet. Yeah. Um, but but you know, working with government at the moment, uh, you know, it's not going. I don't believe it's going to be that long before we are, because the need is great all across this province, Terry. So uh, I, I would say don't overly promote mm -hmm. it yet. But at the same time, uh, if you okay. have a develop, but if you have a developer that's chomping at the bit. Please be let them let them be in touch with us. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Dal well, maybe I'll, Dal maybe I'll, Dalton I'll will be happy. You, uh, I'll contact you maybe offline and get some more info on that. Great, great. Yeah. And and I put I put in the chat uh, our our website to the right fit. Um, and so the developers can definitely contact us. Just let them know that it, you know because we do have people on our wait list from the island as well. Uh, or a, a yeah. side wait list, I guess you would say, uh, because we don't turn anyone away. When somebody contacts us at the right fit, we talk to them. Okay, and good. I just see, um, thank you, Marika, for your comment about housing agreements. And we have used that for other things and we could use that, but I guess we need to have that matching thing in, in place first. So I guess they know where to go find people. So those are both yeah. two good things. Thank, thank you so much. We love to match. We love to match at the right fit. Just wanted to add to that as well. Um, you know, from a, a municipality standpoint, I think a lot of the time the solutions, and this may not be, you know, um, specific to Sydney, but a lot of the times the solutions are, are just in the local relationships that we have. So um, I would love to see right fit, you know, all over the province. Um, sounds mm. incredibly valuable. Um, but while we don't have it, I mean, in Port Alberni specifically, we have Port Alberni Association for Community Living. Um, and we have a couple other organizations as well that um, I know are looking to try to place, um, you know, people who need specific types of accessible housing. So in, in a lot of cases, it's just matching up that one developer with that one association who is the advocate at the moment. Um, but absolutely, you know, as we can kind of streamline across the province, um, uh, one system certainly would, um, you know, make improvements as we go. But great Jerry. work on the 20%. That is um, fantastic to hear. And, and I'm just going to say, Sherry, we look forward to working with you. It's just so fantastic to have a mayor on this in this meeting who cares so much about their community, by the way. So kudos, kudos to you to being here in person talking about these important issues. And you mentioned a wonderful thing there, the connection and relationship between council and governments with our organizations, the community associations and such because there is, there are families that are, are wanting to buy, others who are not able to, but would like to rent. So making those connections with the organizations and finding out the families who are wanting to do one or the other is fantastic. Our next question there is that many people have indicated that accessible housing on the market was too expensive for their budget, as we all know. PWD does not supply a lot of money for any money for housing, really. Um, and financial assistance, PWD or other programs don't cover the cost of rent. Can someone speak to the financial aid programs that are available and where one can find out more information on that? I'm seeing this might be a Stephanie question. Sorry, can I get the last part again? Um, is there um, financial programs available and where does pe where do people find out the information about that? So we know that there's BC Housing, but is there other programs available that might be applicable? Um, that's a good question and not one I'm familiar with. So I think for on our end, um, on the housing's part of it, it, it would be um, the rent supplements or the subsidized directly housing unit that would be available through the BC housing effort. Other areas of financial assistance, either federal or provincial, I'm not as versed in. Well, maybe we can and, 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 oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just gonna say that th there is a uh, rental assistance uh, in the private marker, uh, market, it's called the Rental Assistance Program. And you may want to look at that. And that is um, another area within uh, BC Housing as well. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Raj, you, you have your hand up. 
I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Oh, you're on mute, dear. Thank you. Um, thank you for holding this um, forum today. It's very appreciated. Um, just to go on, um, lastly, Paul, you'd mentioned the rental assistance subsidy. Uh, I think you're, you're, you're referring that through BC Housing, is that right? Yeah. Yes, that, that, that's right. And, it, and it's um, uh, it, nonprofit housing providers um, are able to access those dollars as well. Okay, my, my, I thought that was just for people that are working though. So someone on PWD wouldn't be able to apply for rental assistance. Uh, I'm sorry, you you are correct. My yeah. apologies. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, and then I, have, I had another question as well, but I did want to say that I really appreciate RightFit because they've helped um, one of my family. So I work at the Centre for Child Development in Surrey. So I work with families who have children with disabilities. Um, so the RightFit pilot project has been awesome. And um, those I have so many other families on the wait list right now as well um, who are definitely struggling to even get their children out their homes. Um, so we're really in Surrey with the population. It's... It's a hot mess, but I do appreciate the efforts that have been made by the people in this panel today. Um, my actual question was around the national occupancy standards. Um, I don't know if maybe this might be a question for Stephanie. Um, as you're aware, we work with a lot of refugee families, a lot of immigrant families, and the national occupancy standards just does not work for them. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if that's an area that's been discussed and talked about, because sometimes BC House will go for call my families who have been on wait lists for like 10 to 8 years and 5 years and you know they offer the housing but they don't meet the occupancy standard. Um, and culturally, they are families that do, you know, sleep together, they share rooms, they share beds, and that's just the way it is. So I just wanted to ask if there's any discussion around that piece. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I, and I think what we're seeing is um, a bit of a change management, culture management, ch culture change process that we want to take around recognizing uh, greater inclusion under the occupancy standards for all the reasons you just mentioned uh, and really appreciate you bringing them up. Um, many different groups, many different cultures uh, do live differently, intergenerationally often. And so having um, those standards be um, kind of rigidly enforced and, and, and applied can really put um, families in very, very major housing jeopardy. So we are taking that task uh, underhand. We're working with our colleagues at BC Nonprofit and really working around communication out to the sector that recognizes that these should not be barriers that people are using uh, to prevent housing folks that are desperate for them. Let's be honest, we're not building a lot of four bedroom, five bedroom homes and people with larger families still need somewhere to live. So it's a really important, um, uh, you know, I think aspect of this conversation uh, particularly where there are members of the families with disabilities and they do still, you know, have larger families. We can't forget that sometimes there's going to be people that live that way and, and live intergenerationally. So I think it's a great comment. I think, Marifa, you probably have some more to add. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank no, not a lot, actually. I think you, you've covered most of it, but I just wanted to draw attention to the link that I dropped in the chat there. Um, it was an excellent study um, that was done with the BC Society for Transition Houses. We are looking at um, occupancies, the national occupancy standards, um, and really did an excellent critical uh, uh, review of um, of how problematic they are, that they're based in kind of colonial understandings of what family should be. It's very white, middle class. Uh, they really they've really disentangled that and have come up with some excellent um, recommendations. And so this has been the foundation and informs some of the work that we've been doing with BC Housing, like Stephanie mentioned, um, and uh, also uh, working very closely with the Aboriginal Housing Management Association around the national occupancy standards as well. Uh, this is a very, you know, it's been a, a problematic uh, policy um, that's been applied um, for too long. And so it's really great that we can work collaboratively collaboratively with BC Housing. And I've heard also that CMHC is interested in entering into the conversation. So that would be really amazing if that happened. So, yeah. That was a I, fabulous, I, fabulous question, Raji. Can, um, just can I, can I just make a comment too afterwards? Yeah. 
I, 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 did, I just want to say that I'm really happy that Raji brought this forward because for people with disabilities and larger families, it's one of the ways that supporting somebody with a disability can work really well for families, right? In that it does take a village sometimes, as they say. And so being able to have families be able to support someone, uh, you know, if we look at the big picture, you know, if a family is able to support an individual with a disability and it's working out, it, it helps the whole system move forward. Um, the other thing I just want to say too is that uh, around the occupancy agreement, there's always uh, confusions around people with disabilities that require a live-in caregiver. Um, and the and I think the national occupancy uh, component needs to be more explicit, to be really clear about the fact that a second room needs to be available for someone who has a live-in caregiver, and that you know uh, that 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 individual doesn't get charged for rent and those kinds of things. So it's uh, again, you know, some of it is there, but it's just not clear enough. And so housing providers. Uh, sometimes just they want to do the right thing, um, but they just don't really know or understand. And I think that's where education and information, and we hope that the, you know, we, we've had somebody on the island, for example, contact us where they had difficulties and that they were going to charge a significant amount of money because of the fact they needed a live-in caregiver. And we were able to explain how it worked. And again, that's that, that bridging that the right fit does um, that we got to get across this province. Thank you, Paul, for bringing that up because we do have families mentioning that all the time, along with the sometimes enforced visitor rule. When we've got a family member in the hospital for more than 14 days of a calendar year and we need that extra person to visit, to mind the, pl the place, to look after the other children, whether it's a parent who not living in the same residence, like things like that just need to be adjusted for families like ours. Ben? Um, yes, uh, Bert, we'll come to you after this question here. Um, many of the inaccessible aspects of current housing are caused by building codes that do not consider the needs of PWD and or make creating accessibility related modifications difficult to implement. Mayor Minions, can you talk a little bit about what is happening in Port Alberni around this issue? Thank you. Um, I can't speak really necessarily to the code side of things um, specifically, other than that uh, there is often a way to make things work um, with creative partners on both sides. And, and I think that um, it really comes down to overall community buy-in and community willingness. And I know our staff in the city of Port Alberni are always looking for solutions rather than kind of looking to fit something into a box of a yes or a no. Um, so I think the greater issue here is very much um, about that community buy-in, um, knowing where your com community is going, knowing that um, housing for all, not just you know, for-profit high-end, um, but a variety of housing, um, because all of our communities have a variety of people with a variety of needs. Um, having, you know, recognizing that that is a priority at every level, whether that be um, elected officials, staff, um, exempt staff, union staff, um, and right down, of course, to the community, um, there's always a made way to make something work um, if it's a priority. And, you know, listening here today, a lot of the, the conversations are, you know, about how do we get people into housing faster? And Stephanie, I think earlier you kind of mentioned, um, you know, BC Housing is trying, and in my opinion, trying very hard to build an incredible amount of housing, you know, some pretty aggressive targets um, and not always able to achieve them. And, and that's because it's difficult to build housing in some of our communities. Um, I'm really proud that it's not difficult to build housing in the city of Port Alberni that um, we certainly have standards that, um, you know, we don't want the wrong development in the wrong place. We are not a desperate community by any means. Um, we want to make sure that we have the right fit, but we're always looking for solutions and we really value um, supportive, affordable, you know, the housing that really supports our community members. So um, we've really made it a priority. And, and I think that has kind of trickled down to, to community as well. And now when we have public hearings, we don't get, you know, 100 angry members of the community showing up to oppose if we have a, a new shelter coming in. Um, we recently 
um, approved a, a temporary use permit for, for a short-term shelter while we work toward a longer-term solution. Um, and we had three members of the public um, show up and speak sort of against it. Um, not really firmly against it, but just sort of had some con concerns. And I would say that the concerns that they brought forward actually um, pushed us to make the project a little bit better at the end of the day. So um, it was respectful and it was positive and, and we found a way to make it work. And um, I think if we all hold our communities and our community leaders specifically um, you know, to a standard to recognize the importance of, of building all types of housing in our community, then a lot of these issues just slowly fade away and um, we start to be more solution focused and that certainly moves right down to a, a building inspector and, and kind of code level as well. Yes. Those are some great comments, Sherry. I completely echo what you said and, and have seen much of the same in practice with the city of Surrey. Um, adding to your comments about the code, the uh, there is a mindset change that needs to happen with developers around code. The they many actually don't understand it. Um, and for you know, forgive me if that that is an offensive statement, but the many people do believe that code means accessible. That if they're building to code, they're building to the standard that it, that we're expecting. But as we all know amongst us, that BC building code is is not actually accessible. It's not um, it's not meaningful access. It's really a checkbox list that is safety based. It's not actually people based. So in working with developers and and working with our communities, it's really important to help them understand that 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 code is bare minimum and barely making minimum let's be honest um you know uh, a one in um a one in 12 ramp is actually quite difficult to push up if you're a wheelchair user as opposed to a longer ramp but code says it's fine uh, and that's very true for our residential housing um, codes as well so i know a lot of the work that we do is is very much around helping them understand that code doesn't mean accessible and that going beyond code is actually not breaking code so doing more than the bare minimum does more for our community. It helps our seniors stay in their homes. It helps people who have disabilities stay in the communities that they want to be part of. And, you know, I'll, I'll stand on my soapbox forever, but let's be honest, accessible design can be beautiful and can be functional and can be just as useful for someone who's able-bodied, temporarily able-bodied, or has a disability. Um, so I, I hope that a lot more work is being done around code, and I do look forward to to seeing some code updates and the and the, Beat and the Canada Act coming and making those changes. But um, Sherry, I completely echo your experience. Um, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Karen. Just before we go to Bert, a question's come up here: um, Are realtors aware of the needs of people living with disabilities who are in need of accessible housing? Anybody want to speak to that, or just? Uh, as someone that has has had to purchase, you know, my own place and stuff, uh, it, it is hard to find a good realtor out there that has a good understanding of someone's needs. I find that it's about educating and educating, uh, and, and a person with disability would have to educate. I think realtor, the Realtor Association or whatever they call it should actually have something specific and related to people with disabilities. I'm not aware that they have a program on that. Maybe there is. And I hope that uh, since this is live, maybe somebody within the real estate industry will eventually let us know about what they do in regards to educating their realtors around accessibility. Well, I got the floor. I just got to say a couple quick things around the building code, if you don't mind. And, uh, you know, it, it needs to be practical. The building code, people need to get to the practical aspect of a building code. If you're going to make a, uh, a bedroom so small that somebody in a wheelchair cannot get around uh, a bed, or for example, a caregiver cannot get around a bed, the bedroom is too small, it's not accessible, it's not practical, right? Um, I also want to say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Corinne, in regards to accessible consultants, uh, they need to be part of developments. They must be part of it. And I think that, uh, Cherie, when you have uh, the ability there uh, as mayor, that you know more municipalities need to make sure that developers are having an accessibility consultant involved in the project because they can get to the practical part 
of it all as well. Because what ends up happening too is that the builders end up, you know, sometimes they end up, uh, you know, putting an outlay and have uh, the designs right and everything. But it's the person sometimes down to the nuts and the bolts when they're putting down the concrete that a uh, contractor goes, oh, this is weird. Why is this going here? I'm going to make it what we normally do. And then what ends up happening is that that ramp or that accessible component that was thought about gets missed because of the fact that a contractor thought they were doing the right thing. Then when it's all complete, it's too late. It would cost so much money to fix the thing that ended up happening. So uh, accessibility consultants need to be there from the beginning to the very end and sometimes right on site, making sure that the contractors are doing what is expected. And Paul, you're absolutely right. I have the horrific things I've seen from architecture to actual construction. I wish they'd hire me. <laughs> one, one last thing, and just say that the right fit is looking at developing a video uh, to talk about these kinds of issues as well that we Wonderful. hope will be able to be made available. Wonderful. Just a comment from Sharon before we go to Bert. Um, Thanks, Paul. I think the Right Fit is a great program. I feel there's a gap for those individuals with a physical disability, but is not eligible for the Right Fit. So, uh, Bert, you have a your your hand is raised. And oh, yeah, perfect. Um, I'm Bert. I'm with uh, Spinal Cord Injury BC. Um, I have two roles. I peer coordinator on Vancouver Island. I live in Parksville. And also, I work for. We have an information one eight hundred number where anybody can call anything. Uh, spinal cord injury related from health to holidays. Um, our biggest amount of calls every, every year for the last 20 years, of course, is people desperate for accessible housing. And uh, the comments that everybody else made, um, families were always getting calls from people, social workers, OTs, PTs, whatever, just looking for families is a real challenge. Um, and uh, and other, the wait list is always a big challenge too. Um, years I, I've probably been at the housing sort of aspect of BC Paraplegic Association and Spinal Cord Injury for about 20 years now. And we did used to have a subsidy program that we uh, worked with in uh, with BC Housing that I felt worked really really well. It was a little bit onerous to apply and stuff like that. And uh, I was just, I guess um, my, the problem that I we're finding lately is um, because of the ho housing high prices of housing, people that have lived in houses for um, 10 to 20 years, uh, the houses are being sold and they're, they're, they have a short period of time to find something else and they can't find anything else. And I saw in the comments, somebody was making that their building was being uh, torn down and so subsequently, we're getting these calls three this week of people in that situation um, where, you know, they can't find affordable housing as it is. Um, and so accessibility isn't even in the question. They just want anywhere to live. And I, in the past, we placed people in a totally inaccessible uh, wheelchair suite, a house. Uh, apartment, I should say, but they were able to adapt the living room and live in the living room. It's not perfect, but at least they're not ha on the street. Um, so anyways, my question is, is there a way that, um, is it, there's going to be a lot of studies on the supplement program. I, Paul, Paul alluded to that. Um, is, has there been any consideration for, um, fast tracking some supplements for people that are in crisis situations. And um, I'm thinking of one person I'm working with right now, who's, you know, got until like August 15th to find something. And again, 15 years ago, I was on a panel and it was uh, PWD and nobody can answer this here, but PWD was um, 375 a month. And the, the average rent back then was $600 a month. Um, now it's still $375. And uh, on our info line, we've got three houses for rent right now. Uh, two are at $1,388 a month. And the other one is at $3,100 a month. Um, so the, the young lady that I'm trying to desperately find housing for 
as I just put her in, in contact with Paul, um, but 138 people on that waiting list um, might be able to find something else with some sort of a supplement. So again, my question is, has there been any discussion of while we're going through all this research to have emergency supplements? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, Bert. Um, we've got um, emergency supplements, absolutely. So under the Canada Housing Benefit, um, those are rent supplements that are administered through nonprofit providers. Um, there is access for people who are, you know, at risk of homelessness for sure. So that, is, excuse me, uh, um, an opportunity there. It's not a lot of money and they can be layered. So if there's more than one person in a household who's low income, um, they can put those rent supplements together. Um, I can get you my email address to put you in touch with the right place and the right person. I will be out of the office after this week, but I would, um, if you put your email in the chat, I will connect you with the right person for this. Um, but absolutely recognize that we, we have to have those kinds of emergency. It's very hard because the private market's still very expensive, um, but we do have those measures. But I, I do remark and, and acknowledge um, we've got uh, a real housing crisis with homelessness around the province. Um, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't recognize that there's a lot of people with disabilities um, within the homeless population and that this is something we need way more resources and way more, you know, we do need all uh, kind of efforts to address this um, from all levels. We definitely have some resources, but I would admit that we, we could do with more for sure. So um, I've got your email address. Thanks Bert. I'll send you an email um, mm -hmm. right away and um, about getting the, and what, so you're in uh, what part of the province? I'm in, uh, I'm in Parksville, but I deal, I deal with the whole province. Like okay, on I'll number. connect you with our regional, our, our operations folks who Perfect. can help with this, okay? Yeah, because, uh, um, you know, in a lot of cases, like this this week, three people, the, the one lady, um, I haven't spoken to her, but 21 years in the, the apartment. And, and because, the, and maybe now that the housing markets cooling off that people won't sell us fast. Actually, my son, who's 45 years old and is a contractor, it, his owner uh, sold his house, but he's got the way where they're all to find another place. So um, my concern is, again, um, for the individuals, um, you know, to be in a wheelchair, there's, you know, you guys, I'm talking to a crowd that understands um, there's so many other aspects to it that you can't couch surfing can be done for a certain amount of time, but yeah. you know, if you're couch surfing and yeah, with your, if you even have, you know, I know some of the people that are looking don't have a social uh, network and, and uh, you know, like I say, I know two people that are multiple years and on a wait list and just will would go anywhere. They're willing to move. And, and going back to what Paul said earlier, I work quite a bit with Nanaimo Affordable Housing, and whenever they have a unit available, I can't find anybody. You know what I mean. And as soon as that universe, as soon as that uh, apartment's rented, um, you know, there's a thousand people looking, sort of thing. So um, it, it's a challenge. I, I, again, thanks you guys for uh, putting this on. And uh, thanks, Bert. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, one of the things that I love about doing these 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 uh, calls and the housing Zooms that we've hosted is when we get guests in here and they say, you know, here's my email, reach out to me, I'll get connected with you. And I'm telling you as a parent, when, when you have to drive everything for your kiddo and you hear that from other folks, it's, it just it takes a big load off. I can't tell you how many times um, that what, the relief I feel, and I, 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 that's not going to me, that's going to somebody else here. I just feel I feel, I feel really good about that. It's great having people like that that are willing to support and help. Fiona, you've been so patient. You're next. Okay, my question goes way back. And it's about the developers um, having to do 20% of their new units to be accessible. 
the unit next to me was supposed to have, it's got 215 or 219 units. It's a big place. And the city of Victoria, where I am, tried to insist on this, that you have the 20% units. And the development, sorry, the developer said, you insist, we back out. And they dropped it down to 10%, like one unit out of the 200 whatever and the developer said still you do it you insist we're backing out and there's a housing crisis so you know either the city has to back down to provide 200 and whatever it is units or you know it doesn't get built so that there's a problem there in insisting or trying to encourage developers to build or to include accessible units. The second point I had is I am mobile now. Um, I have a degenerative spinal condition and I have MS. So there will come a time when I am wheelchair bound. I don't have family in Canada. Who's going to be able to help me couch surf until I get a, a space. So do I move now? If I move now, I'm moving out of the city where my doctor, my dentist, my counselor, my pharmacy, they're all in the same place. If I move out of the city, how do I access all the things that I need? And then I'm isolated out in the middle of nowhere, assuming as a single person, I can get a place. I'm not complaining that families are more important or anything like that, but yeah, if you've got five people, you're gonna to want to house them ahead of one person. And I get it, but that still doesn't help. So what things are in, place or coming to be in place to help us encourage the 20% and or single people who need help. Can, you know that can the, I, can I, yeah, sorry, go, ahead. go ahead, Paul, go ahead, Paul. Uh, you know, you go ahead with the 20%. I want to talk about Fiona's situation personally. Well, I was going to say that um, one of the things that we found out over the two years that we've been doing our Zooms on Thursday night about housing is that you know, 5% seems to be the standard. 10% is in a community if they're lucky. 15%, they're groundbreakers. 20%, we haven't heard of it. We've had a group on from the States, um, the Howard County Autism Society, and their goal in Eastern States, Chicago, San Jose is 25%. That's what they do when they do projects, 25%. And, and nobody, we weren't hearing anything like that in BC. And like yeah. I said, you know, 10, 10 was the, and Richmond is the one where they have in their bylaws there that uh, um, contractors, when, if contractors come with proposals for development, they have to have X amount of percentage and, and it's in their bylaws. And so that's, that's pretty groundbreaking, but 20% is, you know, for us is amazing. So. I think, I think Victoria is 20%. I think it's bylaws but it just wasn't enforced in order to build the 200 and whatever it is. Sorry. I'd love to comment on that, Fiona. Um, I, I think you've said a few things that kind of, you know, st stick out to me. Um, first of all, you know, the developer says no, then they say 10% and the developer says no, and they're at risk of losing that 200 um, units of housing. And, and that is, you're right, that's a real struggle. Unfortunately, as municipal leaders, we have to be willing to say no. Um, and I do think that the city of Victoria has been um, an absolute leader in, um, you know, in, in pushing for all types of housing. Um, I've learned an incredible amount watching what Victoria has done. And, and you know, they've, they've kind of paved ahead while the rest of us were at a watching stage. And as a result, they've made a lot of mistakes and we've all had the privilege of learning from those as well. Um, but they're coming from a great place and they're working incredibly hard, you know, to build that housing. 
Um, from my perspective is it's incredibly important that we do not let developers decide what our communities need and get. And um, especially today in the world that we're in, and I know that there's highs and lows in development, um, but you know, let that developer move along then. Um, that housing is going to get built regardless. Uh, somebody else will put in 200 units. Um, you know, our Vancouver Island community specifically and, and you know, the lower mainland, we are in, uh, we are not in a position where we are desperate for finding the next developer, we will find the next developer. Um, it's up to municipal leaders um, and municipal leaders, you know, work as a result of what they hear from the public, or at least we all should. Um, it is up to us to set the standard and, and to enforce those standards. Um, and I think on the other side of that, um, because you know we, we, we can push for those standards, we can enforce them and we need to, um, we also wanna be communities that um, you know, do attract good developers and the right kind of developers. And I think that there's a lot that municipalities can do. You know, we heard earlier um, from Sydney around bonus densities. Um, you know, for anyone who isn't aware of what that is, it's you know, if we have a, our bylaw says you can build to six stories, then we're gonna let you build to seven stories. If you build you know, a certain amount of accessible units or something like that, maybe you have to build fewer parking spaces or you know different types of public amenities um, there's a lot that we have in terms of tools as municipalities that we can offer in order to um, not make it cost prohibitive for those features that we want and need for our communities to build the complete communities that we need to be building um, you know not just communities that are going to be filled with vacant condos of um, you know people who don't even necessarily live in our communities but the types of communities that we need to build through the right type of development, we have a lot of tools as municipal leaders at our disposal to build those. Um, and, and we have to be willing to um, make sure that we hold ourselves to the right, you know, level of standard to get what we want, um, especially in today's world where we know the next developer is coming anyway. So I think it's a balance. I really think that, um, you know, municipal leaders have to make sure they're holding out and, you know, thinking about the long-term needs of our communities and making sure that we get that at the same time, um, we can we can offer developers a lot because we want the right developers to come back and develop again in our communities and we need to make it profitable for them as well can i can i just pick up on that and just say that we need developers to deliver what they say they're going to deliver as well and i find that what ends up happening is that for people with disabilities uh we find that at the end uh, it's not what was promised originally, and it's done. There's nothing we can do about it. What needs to happen is what you're saying, is that somehow that developer needs to be penalized, and it should be clear that they'll be penalized in any future projects because of the fact they didn't deliver what they said they were going to deliver. Uh, and again, I just want to say it's people with disabilities that seem to get uh, thrown away or forgotten about, like, oh, well, you know, it's not as accessible as they said it was going to be. Uh, they can't fix it now because the concrete is done. Um, but there should mm -hmm. be some kind of ability not to have that developer be allowed to get that density the next time or, or, or something there. And, and to be clear about it from the very beginning so that a developer knows, okay, maybe I do need an accessibility consultant for next time and I'm going to, you know, make sure these things happen. I want to go back to Fiona in regards to future planning, um, you know, and, and and it's about, you know, in your situation, you described a situation where, you know, you're going to need wheelchair accessible housing and you're concerned already, you know, that the wait list and when, when I need it, yeah. it, it won't be available for me. So a couple things is, you know, you know, in the unit that you have, is it possible to make it accessible? Is there funding available so that you can make the current place that you have so you don't have to leave to go to another place? If it's not possible to make that one accessible, just to say that the right fit is for individuals that are wheelchair users. But we also recognize that there's going to be individuals like yourself that are going to need access to wheelchair accessible units. So in, in fact, you can still apply to the right fit it would just be acknowledged that you don't need it at the moment, yeah. uh, but we would still do an intake. And we just, you, you may not be on the active live list for us <laughs> right away, but you know, uh, your circumstance may be where there's a beautiful accessible unit that, you know, for some reason it can't be filled and we can talk to you about it because 
it'll be better to go to you than an able-bodied person that will never need the, those features. So that's yeah. how we kind of look at it from the right fit side, if they. Yeah. Uh, um, that's great. Uh, my building right now, right in the center of Victoria, I'm two blocks off Douglas Street. Um, the building is accessible and I chose an apartment. Um, they're all bachelor suites. <clears throat> so they're not exactly roomy. Um, the bathroom that I have, because it's a shower one, I couldn't get a wheelchair in there, let alone transfer it to mm. my shower. And there's a big lip, and I've already slipped and fallen and had spectacular bruises because of that. And the counters are all normal height. I would love to stay here, but this is a St. Vincent de Paul building. So it's already a Catholic charity building. They're not going to want to make it really accessible. And I, I, I would sorry. love, I would love to talk to you about this some more, Fiona. I'd love to take this offline uh, okay. to chat with you about it for sure, because uh, there may be some ideas that we can bounce around a little bit. Uh, can, can I just, uh, with Bert, Bert's uh, uh, question around emergency stops and stuff and th th that question was answered but I do want to say that I think it's important around this province to actually have access to more transition units as well yes. and I think that if we had access to transition units you know where somebody could go for a six-month period of time uh, either because of rehabilitation so that they can go back to their communities faster um, you know there's people that in a moment, you know, they're coming out of GF strong. They have no choice but to sometimes live in Vancouver. But really, they want to go back to their community. But there is no transition units of accessible units available in their community. So a transition unit may be something to consider uh, in all communities moving forward and to deal with those emergencies and things as well and can be fast tracked and those kinds of things. Erin? I know you had something to add here to what Paul was saying. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think I, I put some comments in the, in the chat, but to, just to add into what Paul was saying, I think we can do a lot to help uh, council and mayors understand the importance of adaptive housing and accessible housing and encourage them to create them in the bylaws. Um, the city of Surrey, I know, has a bylaw requiring all new civic builds, so that's rec centers, um, museums, so on and so forth, to be built to um, a universal design standard. And I think as we're seeing some of these new uh, policies roll out from the provincial and federal governments, we can look to our municipalities and, and work together with our councillors and mayors to help them understand the, the needs that we're all discussing here and create those bylaws so that the development so that the developers are held accountable um, and have the developers understand that those folks with disabilities do also have money to spend, many, many of which, and want to be in their communities and stay in their communities for as long as possible. Um, so working, working with our, our councils and helping them understand that those bylaws do make a big difference and developers have a lot of money on the line. They, they know that well, for the most part, they need to stick to their, their bylaws and, and do what's been agreed upon. Um, thank you. If yes, I could just having teeth would be wonderful for these bylaws. Marika, you had a comment about this too? Yeah, I just wanted to add to the discussion around um, developers. And I think it's important sometimes to make a distinction between uh, private sector developers and nonprofit developers because the motivation is quite different. Um, and nonprofit housing providers and nonprofit developers, uh, their motivation is to deliver uh, affordable, safe, um, and secure housing for everyone. Um, they have margins that they have to absolutely work in, and they still have some constraints, but the motivation is different, and the conversation can look different. And so I think one of the ways that communities can support that um, and they also have access to funding that's different than private sector uh, developers as well. 
Um, one of the ways that to support that is to what something that Stephanie alluded to earlier and also Bert mentioned in the comments is going out and supporting and building community acceptance for nonprofit housing and uh, different types of housing forms in your community. We see a lot of absolutely critical housing mm. that has been that gets shut down immediately or at second reading because of of, of fear because of neighborhood change because of a whole bunch of other reasons. Um, and what that means is that we're not seeing uh, those, we're not seeing those critically needed accessible units, larger units, family units, low income housing, um, housing for folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, we're not seeing those built at the rate that we need to because it gets slowed down and it gets caught up in that, in that, um, in that lack of support from community. And so I've just all encourage everyone on this call, whenever you get a chance to go and support, um, really, it's, it's really vital and important to start changing that narrative too around who lives in our communities, who gets to live in our communities. Um, we build inclusive communities and we everyone needs to support that process. So we have a program here at BC Nonprofit Housing Association called the Build Homes Not Barriers program. And this is a program of work we do to support our members in building community acceptance in their communities. Um, we, speak a, we speak in favor at council meetings. We also do advocacy with, with municipalities and um, we have a letter, letter generator. And so we're there. And so if you hear of any projects that need support, uh, please, please let us know. I will put my email address also in the chat um, and contact me. But um, building that support is just so very vital. And nonprofit housing providers and developers are really motivated to provide that safe, affordable, secure, accessible housing that we need. Thank you, Marika. I want to, I'd love to just- um, Can I wait, you know, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, we're talking over each other. And it's hard to tell on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had my hand up for a while, so I, I didn't know if we were- Oh, I was, I was just going to finish up this and then come to you, Terry. Okay, because my comment was related to this conversation, oh, so- Perfect, jump on oh, in. Okay, so um, uh, the comments, uh, so Fiona, sorry to hear what's going on in Surrey with uh, your-, your um, you're building and they're backing down on their commitments. It, in Sydney, we've had, it's part of our zoning bylaw and it's in our official community plan that 20% of units have to be adaptable. And um, what, it, you know, the developers, we can complain about the big bad developers, but really the people who have the control on this are your local mayors and council. And so they're the ones that you have to, talk to. Um, we're going into provincial elections this fall. Yep. And so if I, my advice to people would be, um, you know, uh, sending in questions and uh, to candidates and asking them how committed to the to this issue are they? Are they going to allocate a specific percentage of adaptable or accessible units and um, keep the pressure on? I would be, um, there was a comment made about uh, you know, going out to public hearings when developments are proposed uh, that have adaptable units. I would also encourage you to watch your councils. Mm -hmm. And if, if there's developments that don't include adaptable housing, send in your feedback by email or whatever and say, mm -hmm. I notice you're building, you know, 40 units here, 20 units. There's no adaptable units. And count, I mean, I know in our council, when we get feedback from the community, um, council listens to that, especially if there's a lot of it and people are persistent. So I, I would encourage you to uh, to do that, to put pressure on your councils. That's, that's how things are gonna change, I think. So I'll leave it at that, thanks. I have a response to Terry um, that you said that you were living in Sydney. I actually live in Victoria, right downtown. And my 
mayor is Lisa Helps, who has created an either love her or hate her feeling in Victoria. And in England, we call that a Marmite thing. You either love Marmite or you hate it. So it can be a Marmite car or a Marmite mayor at this point. And it's she that, I don't want to say it, but she rolled over on the one um, accessible housing unit in the building next door. Um, it's also that across the road was private condos. They've got affordable condos for the low income. They started 100,000. I don't know anybody who can afford 100,000 who's on PWD. I just, if no, you know I'm how to get that, I'd love to know. Well, in terms of the you know, getting whether mayor, mayors or councillors roll over. I mean, like Sherry said previously in her comments, is that you really have to have a, a council and mayor that are committed to this sort of thing. And the way to do that is through our democratic process. So use your, uh, use your leverage that way is my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree with that more. Um, and, you know, it was kind of mentioned earlier, um, you know, that we need to be asking these questions. And Terry, you're completely right. Uh, municipal elections in BC are October 15th. And um, I know that the um, BC Nonprofit Housing Society, Marika, has been, um, they've been putting out some, some good information on, um, you know, different municipalities. And um, there's organizations that are doing kind of reports on um, how easy it is to approve um, the needed housing in communities. Um, and it's so important to ask these questions now um, because it often does you know become an election issue and I know somebody posted in the um, chat about the Parksville project that was built and I believe that was an election issue um, last uh, four years ago and project ended up getting built and it certainly has not caused the issues that people you know feared and and they rarely rarely do um and you know what we find more than anything and what I found in my community because I I always remember that my first public hearing after getting elected as a city councillor eight years ago um was an affordable housing project first public hearing I had ever been to I had never attended one in my life when I got elected to council um and we had about 100 people in the room all very angry and very upset and our council ended up to um declining or you know voting against that project and it did come back we were able to bring it together and get it approved um you know slightly different and um and not better in that case um but it's it's that community dialogue um and then often seeing those projects come into the community not cause issue that changes that um that changes the perception of, of your community over time so it's really important um it's you know been talked about come out to public hearings we usually we always get people who are opposed to things coming out to public hearings. Um, we rarely get people who are in support. So, you know, don't assume that not showing up means people assume you're in support. It is really important to show up. And more than anything, um, important to engage with local government generally. Um, the local government engagement and people watching council meetings and understanding what we're responsible for. Um, engagement is pretty low in most municipalities. Um, certainly higher in places like Victoria, for sure, where, you know, it is um, there's a lot of media coverage, but in our smaller municipalities, we don't have that. And so, you know, people maybe knowing what's going on and coming out when they, when something is important, um, isn't as common. So it's, it's really important to get engaged, watch your council meetings and, and, and send feedback and send it even when it's positive and ask about these types of housing. Thanks, Sherry. Um, just wanted to point out, uh, we've mentioned that to Sherry when she was on. You know, if these conversations need to happen at UBCM, these conversations need to happen at the BC CEO network when they meet. Um, we're going to have this conversation. Hopefully, we put in a proposal for a parents panel at the uh, Housing Central Conference this fall. And all four of the people that are going to be uh, part of that panel are on this call today. So that's super cool. Um, so I wonder, do you guys have any plans tonight? I think we're going to be going until about 11 or 12 by the rates of things here. Um, but okay, well, uh, I, I come to Jan that. after this question. I was just going to say that, Ben. Yeah, we're going to go to Jan after this question. So some people in the survey commented on the fact that uh, the most common accessibility features in accessible housing often does not consider the accessibility needs of a diverse range of people with disabilities. 
including people with autoimmune disorders and other invisible disabilities. Can someone speak to the different types of accessible housing there is available for these groups? And what is there being done to provide more diverse accessible features beyond wheelchair access? Um, I'll just jump in here super quick, um, unless Stephanie, oh no, okay. I can't see everybody, so I don't know if people are unmuting or not, but um, uh, I just said, yes, yes, yes. Uh, a lot of the accessible building is, uh, units, as far as I understand them to be in, um, in, in our sector are generally around mobility. So there aren't a lot of accessible units that take into consideration sound for instance, or noise, uh, which would which make it uh, more accessible for folks uh, who have uh, who are very sensory uh, oriented. Um, you know, we don't have units that that take into consideration smell and odor. Um, for you know, folks who have chemical sensitivities, we don't like our. So our our I, I think our our. Um, our definition of accessible housing, it, particularly in the nonprofit sector anyway, has historically been quite limited. Um, and we're not really seeing, uh, I think more and more that's being uh, incorporated in, in, into design is like thinking about accessibility in a more, uh, in a broader sense. Um, you know, uh, you know, things like pocket doors. I just learned this the other day. Pocket doors are, they look really cool and nifty. Like you can, oh, look, the door disappears into the wall, but it's actually impossible to put in tracks for a lift from a bedroom to a bathroom with a pocket door. I mean, developers, we don't think about this in terms of design, right? We think, how are we maximizing the space that we can actually use? Um, and so we're actually working right now on a research proposal uh, with BC Housing and a, and a consultant to look at a three-year project looking at what accessibility actually means um, and what accessibility means in terms of housing in the nonprofit housing sector for the outcome to be a, uh, a guidelines on design. Um, and we're, we're still building this research proposal. So it's in the very, it's in its infancy um, because we're, we are, you know, we acknowledge that there is a huge gap in terms of what we see as accessible and what's available uh, in, in, the, in the community housing sector. So um, we're, we're working on it, I guess is my, my short answer. And it's so important too to think about everything. I remember this one time we were at BC Children's Hospital going to a cortical visual impairment clinic. And while I was able to wheel the wheelchair and the luggage, because we were coming from Victoria, my daughter was walking in front of the wheelchair with a cortical visual impairment and everything was beautiful, beige, and yeah. everything was arching. And then there was beige furniture. And she was basically a ping pong off of everything. And my thought walking down, down the hall was, these are children with vision impairments. Why would you make it so lovely and beige? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. but years ago, I would never have thought of that because mm -hmm. that wasn't the life I lived. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, you had another comment to add? Yeah, I was just going to zoom out and say, you know, we're, we're learning, right? We're on our learning journey. And I, and I think it's the result of ableism. Let's be honest. We're talking about living in a society that was constructed without ever considering anything except non-disabled people's um, capacities. So, you know, uh, a story when I first joined BC Housing that really hit me was um, a woman that ha was blind and she had a guide dog. And she lived in, she worked, but she still needed affordable housing. And she was living in a studio apartment um, after she was renovated out of a basement suite. And she, the studio apartment that she moved into was too small for her to let her guide dog, her guide dog out of its crate. So this guide dog would be crated, you know, 23 hours a day kind of thing. Um, started to impact its performance, um, pulling her into traffic, but she couldn't let it out of the crater. It would become a tripping hazard for her because the, it would know it's off duty. So we had to get her, um, it moved into a one bedroom, but these are things that like are on none of our radars um, and are not being discussed. And we have no way of knowing until we actually pause and listen to the voices of people who have been excluded. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful that we're moving in that direction. I know 
it feels overwhelming, even like a weight in the chest. I don't know how the rest of you feel um, when we think about how this has not performed well for people and their families. And, um, and there's the range that was mentioned, the range of disabilities um, that when you think about it in the truest sense, um, are not defects with human beings, right? It's defects in our system. It's our system that has failed to recognize all of the ways that human beings present themselves and, and live in, in, and exist in the world. And I think that's the part that really um, inspires me for change. It is a lot of work and it's tiring because these are frustrating systems to navigate. Um, but I just want to really recognize that it's true. Like we just have not had the full appreciation of how ableist we have constructed our built environment and that there's a lot of work to do. Thank you, Stephanie. Jan, you had your hand up a while ago and apparently I was on mute when I called on you. So would you like to ask your question now? Okay, now you're on mute, Jan. Lucky you. <laughs> Hi, the regulars will understand that comment. Um, I just have a couple of comments, <clears throat> pardon me. And, and I think part of it is uh, we need to have a national policy, housing policy. We had one in the 1980s and it was uh, disassembled by John Knight from the Liberals and everything was downloaded to the province along with some housing money to go along with it, our job done. Um, it hasn't really worked out very well for many of the reasons that everybody has outlined. And I think the last speaker spoke to it quite eloquently. But mo moving on, we can't undo that, but I think maybe we can be a little bit more creative in what we are doing. Um, and maybe part of that is doing something along the lines of a um, housing registry in communities, not and pairing people up so that they they uh, cohabitate and <clears throat> pardon me perhaps maximize the use of space and that there's synergies that re that will come from that in terms of um, less isolation extra contact all those other kinds of things and I think that in terms of the nimbyism there's no doubt that it still exists. But the problem that people are now experiencing in terms of no real affordable housing. I live in Powell River. It's shocking. So many people who have been rent, rent, owned rental properties have sold because our housing prices have more than doubled here. And the, the landlords have gotten out of the business because it's a headache. Uh, for a lot of years, you couldn't even make your costs being a, a landlord here. Um, but that doesn't help the people that are still renting. And uh, as an example, there's a three bedroom listed out of town, $3,500 a month. So we have to get creative. And I think that there's less opposition now because almost everybody knows someone who is in a housing crisis. And I think that will soften people to perhaps look at different ways. I believe it was Richmond, uh, probably in the er late 80s, early 90s, they explored a housing list where they paired up single parents so that two single parents co-housed. Um, and I believe that that was actually quite successful. It never really took off and was adopted elsewhere. But I think that it was really beneficial to the people who... Um, were involved uh, and not all redevelopment is ugly. We currently are uh, redeveloping a property that we had that had eight units, small cottages, and it's being um, redeveloped. There's gonna be 24 units and four accessible, Not I can't speak to how, but four accessible units 
Unfortunately, uh, two of the individuals who were in the eight units have passed away, but all those six people will be given um, first refusal on the units and they are all deep subsidy units. So it's not all bad news, but there's very little good news. Thanks, Jan. Um, just a question that came in from David here. Should there be accessibility requirements for single family homes or only for multifamily? Anybody want to tackle that one? I'd say yes. I think everything should have an adaptability or accessible fa a factor to it. I mean, as we heard from Fiona, you know, as we age, as life happens, as things happen in our life, we shouldn't have to up and move from where we are. You know, we should be able to age in place gracefully with new buildings. I mean, yes, the old ones are what they are and we can only do so much, but with any new build, I feel that there should be that ability to age in place, emergency in place, what have you. Yeah, that's we're my two cents. <laughs> Sorry. No, I was just going to say we're looking at the range of what we call adaptability. So there's the let's call it light adaptability, where you've got reinforced bars, um, uh, reinforcement in the showers for grab bars, um, so heights of plugs, kind of universal design. So we're looking at that being the minimum uh, of adaptability. And then we're looking at a middle range of adaptability where there's turning radiuses, where there's, you know, the sizes are already considered. Um, so that for us, at least our goal is, and the policy work we're doing, is to see that we either have a, a set housing that is built to a certain accessible um, standards, recognizing the range of disabilities, vision impairment, hearing impairment, um, you know, people with sense sensitivity, other, other forms that like we've been talking about, and that the balance is all adaptable based on some range. So the ideal situation for us is that if you're in housing in a place and you're aging or you 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 know have changes in your life that bring on different and the barriers now are presented in the built environment, those changes can be made either in your suite or within your building um, instead of looking at full relocation into another place. That's ambitious and we're working on it. Uh, it's, we've done a costing exercise on it um, and we're looking for ways to kind of of, of, of seeing the, the, the resources come for that. Um, but that's our kind of goal is, is to see ourselves have that. Um, if it's not accessible out of out the box, that the remaining is adaptable to varying degrees. And that accessible out the box involves looking at the demographics, knowing the needs in the community and building specific um, for the different needs. Thank you, Stephanie, for the work that Thanks. you're doing within BC Housing with that. Karen, I am going to assume that you have something to input here about universal design and accessibility. <laughs> uh, thanks, Rachel. Uh, yeah, no, I, Stephanie, I love hearing what you're saying and the work that you're doing. And uh, I couldn't agree more. I think we all have the, the, we should all have the right to live where it is that we feel most comfortable, whether that is in a dense tower or in a home. So seeing some single family homes being accessible, being adaptable, I'd love to see that. That's something that I would like personally for our family. Um, we live in a condo that's not adapted or accessible, despite the fact that my husband is a manual wheelchair user. We kind of make it work, uh, but something as simple as like a flush threshold for him to get outside, he actually can't independently go out onto the patio uh, in our own home. Um, so as, as someone who would love to get an actual home, uh, yes, I would love to see that, David. Thank you for that comment. And, and, let, and you know me, I, I, you've already heard me. I, I'm all about the universal design. So let's make it work for everybody, not just adapted and accessible, but really everybody deserves a home that they feel comfortable and can truly live in and homes that they can visit too yes visit visiting creating community thank and you for like saying that 
but I know so many people with disabilities who perhaps have a home that works for them, but they can't actually go visit their friends. And we, we know how important connection is, especially after the last two years. Um, and it's, I mean, certainly we go to many friends' homes that, that Marco's stuck on the first floor or, or outside or whatnot. And, and that's just, that's not, that's not inclusive. That's not meaningful. And at points, you just can't carry people in. Right. It's, it, it can be hard. Just going, to do a, just going to do a 15 minute reminder and then Rachel's going to do a follow up question. Thank you, Ben. Um, there is a follow up question here from Annie saying designers, architects, technologists, etc. are there to help clients navigate regulations. They face similar situations often. For instance, they have to challenge building codes to meet the meet the energy targets. All they need is the mandate from clients to do so. How is the design community involved in these conversations? That's a fabulous question. Does anybody want to take that? That's a good question. And the, yeah, I don't know if there's any design folks here, but uh, I just know that um, people are coming out of architectural school without this kind of exposure and this kind of conversation. Um, I know Ontario, they hired a consultant named, I think it's Thea Curdy, who helped doing some work with uh, the profession with the Architectural Institute of Ontario. Um, I think that it was, I think it was Thea, right, Marika? Um, yeah, so I think that's the kind of work that's more broadly necessary in our profession. For BC Housing, we can influence some designers because of our building guidelines, but um, I think a broader engagement um, with these professional associations is critical in order to see them really start to get um, a critical kind of let a, a mass movement uh, of these professionals to recognize the long and troubled history uh, of inaccessibility in the built environment. Okay, um, thanks, Stephanie. Um, another question here. Um, a few people who took our survey pointed out that they live with assistant, assistance animals and need housing that is both accessible and pet friendly. Can someone speak to what the rights of residents with support animals are when securing accessible housing and how they, they can assure that their support animal is welcomed at their resident? Great question. Anybody? Well, uh, I, I can. You know, I'm not an expert in this area other than to say that, you know, that they have the right to have their uh, have their um, uh, dog avail available in the units. Um, that's number one. Uh, having them welcomed is another issue altogether, I guess. Right. And this is the area uh, that needs to continue to be worked at in regards to educating the public. Uh, as well. I think that um, there still needs to be some work done. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, I, I know the nonprofit sector does a really good job on educating their uh, providers in regards to this. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, we continue need to work on making sure that the management of those buildings and stuff are very well educated in this area so that they could be educating people um, as they are people coming in and out of the building. Because uh, we've been told that there's people that have been living in their building for a long time with their service dogs. And then all of a sudden somebody moves in, you know, uh, it needs to be talked about that service animals um, are there and will be there. Um, Nicole, you had your hand up. Were you gonna speak to that? Different Nicole, I think, not sure. Okay, Fiona, did you wanna to speak to the, the pets? Your hand was up. No. Unmuted. Um, it wasn't specifically about pets, but I think that if you have a service dog, then it should be absolutely allowed in to your suite, whether it's a private landlord or not, it's 
the, the need that you have. But it was something that we were talking about a little earlier about air quality and air and fragrance sensitivities. My building was supposed to be a non-smoking building. I think about 60% of the residents actually smoke. Now, I have asthma. So when somebody smokes and they light up outside, they breathe out and I get a face full of fresh cigarette smell. The other one is, yes, absolutely. It is definitely your right to smoke pot. I never have. I don't smoke. I've never smoked. I don't particularly, oops, sorry. I don't, apparently I'm supposed to stop now. Um, I don't particularly want to be sitting here in my living room getting high because somebody else needs to smoke. So, I mean, is there anything that we can talk about for that? I don't want to ban people, but if it's supposed to be a non-smoking building, then it's supposed to be a non-smoking building. Can anyone speak to that, please? Thank you for that question, Fiona. Does anybody have any thoughts about the smoking? I know with the pets, um, the difference between pets and service dogs, service dogs are allowed anywhere except for private residences. Um, some establishments such as churches and kitchens, like- uh, Food prep. Yeah, food prep areas. Um, aside from that, as long as they've got the credentials, they can't be turned away from anywhere. Yeah. Uh, a, de a designated service dog or guide dog has uh, full legal rights to be with with their uh, person, <laughs> uh, for, with the person who requires guidance. Um, so that their legal rights are such that their uh, you can file a human rights complaint if someone is to be evicted because of a designated or service dog. However, that, that is correct, Jen, they do have to be registered. A therapy animal or a support animal um, doesn't meet the same legal parameters. And I know that there's a federal uh, thing in works right now to have all service dogs registered under the same testing so that it's not different from municipality to municipality, area to area, um, just so that you know people from Alberta can still use their, their card here in Victoria without being penalized for not having the proper credentials for Victoria. So there is that also. Um, we had another question here about what can a person do when the building they're living in is resistant to making the building accessible by putting in accessible doors, et cetera. Is there any organization that could insist or could assist or would this be a human rights complaint? This is from Ashley. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a Paul question. Um, you know, it, in regards to this, you know, it, it, it's about trying to work First of all, if there's a strata involved, if there is, um, uh, you know, if it's a nonprofit, uh, there's upper management that you can communicate with uh, in regards to looking at, um, you know, this component around accessibility. Um, if indeed there is not, um, you know, there, I'm trying to think of some other aspects before you go to the human rights situation. Uh, it is a good way to go, you know, in dealing with stuff, but it takes so long. So it's really about trying to work through all the different other ways first. Um, um, uh, but sometimes it does have to get through the legal component. Um, Paula, if I could jump in as well. Uh, please, just, please. Just, just a thought on that, that uh, it's an experience we've had in our building. Um, speaking to the, the need 
at a great to a greater audience is often useful. So when you're speaking to your strata council, your co-op manager, uh, whoever's operating your building, advocating for a single person for a door opener um, may not be the best avenue because they don't see the business case for it. But when you're explaining that, let's say a door opener in a building, ours didn't have one when we first moved in, not only helps the person who's using a mobility device, it's also helping the parent pushing a stroller. It's helping the person who's carrying their bags, their arms are full of groceries uh, with lovely paper bags that are about to rip. Um, and helping people understand that once those accessibility features are installed, basically they're not really taken away and they end up helping more than just this single person who kind of you think the accessible uh, feature is meant for. Um, so kind of helping the council, helping the operator understand that those features help all of us um, and even themselves, because you never know, maybe one day they'll need it too. Well, and think of it during the pandemic, how many of us only went to stores at the beginning that had sliding doors because we didn't know if we were supposed to touch things, not supposed to touch things. You know, I still try to pick the ones that I don't have to touch because now I'm really grossed out by people. But it's those functions that are there that help my daughter when she's going in independently that also helped a lot of people during the pandemic you know, alleviate some of their fears. Okay, I've got one last question here before we get into our summary. Um, so I'm gonna share with you, a lot of the folks that come on our Thursday night, the model that they want for their kiddos is, uh, for instance, for me, my daughter have a roommate and the third room is for caregivers, whether it's a live-in, you know, or rotating shifts or whatever. So this is a great question that's tagged onto that. Some of the people who took our survey talked about how there is not enough accessible multi-bedroom, multi-unit apartments for those who need a live-in caregiver or live with families. Can someone speak to what housing options are available for families and those who live with their caregivers? Last question, last answer, who wants it? We need the Jeopardy music right well, now. I'm going to call on Stephanie. For sorry, last comments or sorry, was that last questions? For to answer the last question, if you have any thoughts or ideas about the last question. I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay, I'll try it again. Sorry. Uh, some of the people who took our survey talked about how there is not enough accessible multi-bedroom, multi-unit apartments for those who need a live-in caregiver or live with their families. Can you speak to uh, what housing options are available for families and those with live-in caregivers? Yeah, I think we're taking this on. Thanks for repeating it. I, I think what we're trying to take on is acknowledging multi and intergenerational households um, and also households of family choosings. So that may be people that come together either in romantic partnerships or as family units um, to uh, live communally in ways that are supportive of each other um, and that our housing typology be better framed to fit that. Um, so that is a part of that overall policy review work that we did do um, that I mentioned around the adaptable, accessible um, housing kind of question um, was looking at creating larger family units, more types of family units, so that you see more bedrooms presented, uh, that people can look at building their, their, the family of their choosing or the family that they are related to, um, because of, I really want to recognize that that's a way that people get a lot of support out of living as well. Um, yes, some of us want to live alone. Some of us want to live with others. And, and I think it's an important area. Um, we've, I think it'll encompass a lot of things culturally, um, non-Canadian um, kinds of non-Anglo families. It recognizes Indigenous um, family compositions. It recognizes then people abil ability to live in the families of their choosing. And just to add again that around people that require a live-in caregiver of some sort, again, just being sure that they're not being charged for needing that extra room, I think is really critical. Um, and we need to continue to look at policies around that. Thank you, Paul. 
I believe that we have reached our time for this. And of course, like Ben said, we could go for days about this, but I'm going to pass it to Emily to wrap us up for the afternoon. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much to everyone. Uh, what a lively discussion. Uh, I really enjoyed listening and learning and I hope everyone here did as well. Apologies for not getting to everybody's questions. There were lots of great questions asked and unfortunately two hours just goes by quite quickly. But I have put in the chat um, a link to Ben and Rachel's discussions that happened on Thursday evenings, a Zoom link. So you can check that out and also the individual um, host and panelists emails. So uh, if you're not able to grab all this information here, again, a transcript of the chat will be sent out um, after this meeting, uh, probably next week, early next week with, a, with an email that we're gonna include all the resources mentioned, um, panelist emails, uh, transcript of the chat, survey results, all of the stuff. If you could take a second, Nicole's just gonna pop up a survey. Um, it's just a very quick two minute survey on how we did today. If you could just let us know so we can make sure that we are making these accessible community forums more accessible and inclusive and better every time, that would be wonderful. And again, if you have any follow-up questions, concerns or comments or ideas for future forums, you can also email me directly. I'm just putting my email in the chat here so thank you again so much to our panelists to our hosts uh what an all-star team we had going on also to all of our volunteers who were jotting down attendance and resources and doing tech um thank you so much for your time and being a part of this thanks everyone all the best thank, thank you so you. much take care everyone have a wonderful thank time. you <laughs> bye have a great Friday. <laughs> Emily, Emily, did you want us to stay on when we're done or did we just take off? You, you're good, you're good, yeah. I'm not sure if that survey ended up launching, but- It didn't. It no. didn't, that's happened to us once before, so that's okay. But yeah, <laughs> I thought it was a great discussion. So thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, I love your lineup. It was great. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much. We'll definitely send around a wrap up email to everyone and you can share with your communities as well. Cool. Have a great weekend, everybody. Cool. Happy Friday. Thank you for hosting and the ability to participate. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Karen. She was it. great. Yeah, I don't know, Nicole, that's happened before. So weird. <laughs> I don't know what's up. It's a little finicky. Kevin, thank you so much. Yeah, if you could just send me the attendance after this that would be wonderful and angela thank you if angela's not gone already okay um jasmine can you just grab a copy of the chat i've already copied it it's beautiful okay cool you just put it in a document in the acf folder good job everyone that was very very seamless honestly that, that was really good uh aside from the muting thing at one point but now <laughs> But now we know what to deal with next. But I thought our hosts were great. So well done. Uh, thank you for all of your help. Okay. We'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Yeah, thank you. Have a good weekend. So I land the meeting.